I'm Susie Banacarum filling in for Emily Rooney. The grief and elation of two New England families have been the center of international attention over the past week, and one of those families is finally celebrating tonight after the safe return of Peter Theo Curtis, a writer held by an affiliate of Al-Qaeda in Syria for more than two years. Hours after landing at Logan Airport, Curtis made his first public statements, emerging from his mother's home this morning to thank those who worked tirelessly for his release. In the days following my release on Sunday, I have learned bit by bit uh, that there have been literally hundreds of people, brave, determined, and big-hearted people all over the world working for my release. They've been working for two years on this. Um, uh, I, I had no idea when I was in prison. I had no idea that so much effort was being expended on my behalf. Um, and now having found out, I am just overwhelmed with emotion. I'm also overwhelmed by one other thing, and that is that total strangers have been coming up to me and saying, hey, we're just glad you're home. Welcome home. Glad you're back. Glad you're safe. Um, great to see you. So I suddenly remember how good the American people are and what kindness they have in their hearts. And to all those people, I say a huge thank you from my heart, from the bottom of my heart. Curtis's release came just days after another American hostage journalist and New Hampshire native James Foley was beheaded by a different militant group. And some have suggested that timing was not a coincidence. I'm joined now by Jim Walsh. He's an international security expert and research associate in the MIT Security Studies Program. Welcome back to Greater Boston, Jim. Good to be with you. Thank you so much. And um, Jim, I think uh, the thing that really strikes me is that this really isn't a coincidence. What's the relationship between the timing here? One of our contributors, uh, Charlie Sennett, has said that he thinks this is an, an attempt by them to really distance themselves from the beheading. Yeah, I think it is. It, it, you know, we won't know for sure. We don't have the documents. We haven't talked to the Qataris. But uh, the timing would certainly make it look that way. Remember that ISIS or ISIL uh, is a uh, Al Qaeda offshoot, kicked out of Al Qaeda because of its uh, that it, it was too violent and savage for Al Qaeda, and has been co in competition with this other group, which is a pro Al Qaeda group. And the two have been fighting, fighting on the ground, literally. And, and so this was an opportunity after the fallout from uh, the uh, beheading of the American journalists. For for them to separate out, play it differently, and also not, you know, let ISIS take all the hits they're going to take over the next months and years and, and, and stay away from that. So it might have been political maneuvering. It might have been that the Qataris playing this middle person role was able to do something, uh, had some leverage with them, and was able to produce a result that others couldn't produce. We, we don't know for sure, but that's the way it looks. So what, let's talk about that, the role of the Qataris. They were also involved in negotiating the release of those uh, American teenagers in Iran. Why are they so involved in these kinds of negotiations? What's in it for them? Well, I think there are two things going on. First, they're a small Gulf state. And so one of the ways, if you're an Oman or a United Arab Emirates or a Qatar, the way you have leverage is that you're a go-between between the other big players. The big players in the region are Saudi Arabia and Iran, and you carve out a niche in diplomacy, being able to talk to different groups. The other thing that sort of goes in the opposite direction on this is that Qatar, along with Saudi Arabia, has been one of the principal funders of the rebel camp in Syria, a opposing Assad, and in particular, to the dismay of many, funding what many people would call extremists. Now, that's a bad thing. I think that's a bad thing. But it probably means that the Qataris have some relationships that they can call on, some leverage with these groups if they've supported and funded them in the past and are able to sit down and have a meeting, whereas, you know, the U.S. was not going to get that kind of meeting. Okay, so here's the thing, is that at this point, they've probably debriefed Curtis, right? I mean, he's, he's probably been thoroughly debriefed by American officials. What do you think they've hoped to learn from him? Are they, are they hoping to get the location of the other hostages from him? Is that even likely? You know, I think they would expect very little. Uh, first of all, he seemed great on camera, but he's going through this big emotional, psychological process right now. I'm sure the kidnappers were, uh, these are experienced, trained guys. They're not novices. They've been doing this for a while. They would have taken uh, measures to try to insulate him and prevent him, knowing that if he was released, he was going to be interviewed. And if they thought he would, didn't know anything, then they'd simply change what they'd been doing. They'd change the locations of where they were keeping people, or they'd change and move things around in response to knowing that he was going to be released. So the other big related news today was this video released by the mother of uh, Stephen Sotloff. She, uh, you know, sort of made a direct plea to those who are holding her son. And he was in the same video as Foley uh, and, you know, threatened in that video. Let's hear what she had to say. Hmm. I've always learned that you, the caliph, can grant amnesty. I ask you to please release my child. 
As a mother, I ask your justice to be merciful and not punish my son for matters he has no control over. I ask you to use your authority to spare his life and to follow the example set by the Prophet Muhammad who protected people of the book. So one thing that struck us in the newsroom is that she appealed directly to the caliphate, right, in mm -hmm. an attempt to sway yes. the kidnappers. And is there a danger in her doing that and giving them some sort of dangerous legitimacy? No, not at all. I mean, they're not going to be defined by what a, a, a mother in a terrible situation, the words they use. They're going to be defined by their own actions. Right. You know, if they behead people, they're going to be defined by that. If they're going to bury people alive, if they're going to put them on crucifixes, they're going to be measured by that. I don't think anyone can blame, you know, I'm a parent. I don't think anyone would blame any mother or father in, in that situation for saying anything in order to try to persuade them to release uh, their children. And I think it's wise for her to appeal to them based on their values. You know, that's the, she, the odds here of this working are infinitesimally small, but you got to try. And if you're going to try, your best shot is to try to say, hey, by your own uh, standards, by your own principles, you should act this way. So I, I think it's completely legitimate. And so how many other hostages do we think are being kept right now between Iraq and Syria? And, and do we know if they're primarily journalists? Are some of them aid workers or civilians? You know, I don't know what the latest number is. There's a database. The University of Maryland has a global terror database, which anyone can find online. And it divides up terrorist acts into different categories. And there's one for hostages. And what you see as you look at the trend line is really since about 2003, 2004, the numbers have jumped on the charts where you have hostage taking. Uh, and a lot of it there in Syria, in Iraq and elsewhere, sometimes for money, sometimes for ideological purposes. Uh, a lot of it is business people who get snatched for cash. Um, but there's no doubt that the, the ideological nature of this conflict uh, with ISIS uh, and the horrific things that they're doing changes that from less of a commercial enterprise to something that is going to be used in other ways. I think the, the American journalist who was murdered, that ha uh, you know, that has to do with the U.S. getting involved and in, in having airstrikes against uh, uh, ISIS in, in aid of the Kurds and in aid of the Iraqis. And so I think that's to be expected. It's sad and unfortunate and wrong. But it's not surprising. But you think that's direct retaliation. That's a yes. little different. Yes. So, you know, one other part of the story that really interests us here is this idea that not all of the Americans in Syria are, you know, there as journalists or civilians. It appears to be that some Americans are now traveling over there to fight alongside sure. the militants. And there was this case of Douglas McCain, who was born in Chicago, who went to uh, Syria and died over the weekend. Fight. Do we know anything about who these guys are, who these people are? Well, there has been more attention to that, after 9-11, the number of Americans, so-called homegrown terrorists, who might connect with a jihadi website or propaganda and then travel overseas, uh, that, those numbers seem to have increased. I think there's a tendency, though, to uh, give this more weight than is actually statistically the case. I mean, the overwhelming majority of people who are fighting there are from the region, right? And so there are some people, because they're Americans, they're naturally going to draw more attention from the media, and that's understandable. I don't know how important it is at the end of the day. You know, if, even if you took all the Americans away, there'd be plenty of jihadis there fighting or drawn to it. As far as the Americans go, I think you also want to draw a distinction between folks who have some organic tie to the region. Maybe they have had family or a language tie or something, or they've been there in their past. Some tie versus the people who just sort of have no tie whatsoever and then decide to become a, a militant extremist and violent. And, and you know, everyone wants to know why. Why would people do this? Why would yeah. you go to Syria of all countries? And then why would you join a terrorist group? And I think, I know people want to have an answer for that, but the big, the big general answers like ideology, they don't work very well, very well because this is a rare event. This is really the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the, the uh, phenomenon. It almost never happens. So general causes don't explain it very well. All right. Well, Jim Walsh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.